Adolf Hitler, the Führer, dictator of Nazi Germany, along with Mao and Stalin, one of the most evil killer leaders of the 20th century. The Treaty of Versailles ended World War I. The treaty stripped defeated Germany of territory, of weapons, and what was left of its economy. Hitler was provoked to write his book, Mein Kampf, in English, My Struggle, where he laid out his plan for a new world order. His Nazi party would restore Germany and take over Europe. You know, I was a young guy also in those days, but I think their aim was how to, by political measures, you know, get an improvement of the whole situation means primarily economically, politically. And no member of any other party was idolized like Hitler in his party. He was a great leader, you know, in nothing, no word against him, no critique against him. What he said, this was right. Know that. The first thing uh, that was implemented by Hitler after he had taken to power was a ministry of propaganda. And under this ministry, all of the information industry had been centralized within half a year. That is, there, were, there was only one radio channel that was completely controlled by the Nazis and all of the print industry, all newspapers, all magazines, were under control of a censor that sat in the Ministry of Propaganda. Uh, it was strictly forbidden by law uh, to listen to foreign radio stations, to, to radio stations outside Germany. Uh, so the first thing they tried was to limit the Germans' view on the outside world and make them think in the direction the Nazi party had decided the people should think to. In fiery speeches, day and night, to thousands, he preached two great evils, Judaism and communism. Over six years, Hitler built an overwhelmingly powerful and tactically brilliant military force, ground, sea, and air.
The ME-109, also called the BF-109, was Nazi Germany's most important fighter aircraft, both in operational importance and in numbers produced. It was arguably the best fighter in the world in 1940. It was faster than the Spitfire at high altitude, could dive more rapidly and carried a more effective armament of two cannon and two machine guns. The beginning of the end of the ME-109 as an unparalleled force of aviation began in August 1942 with the introduction of American heavy bombers, such as the B-17 that gave the Allies the ability to bring the fight into German territory. The entire war for the Luftwaffe had been offensive, and because of this, only two 109 units were stationed to defend the Reich. On top of this, German pilots had never encountered a bomber like the B-17 that could take such a punishment as well as dish it out. The introduction of the P-51 Mustang to the European theater in the spring of 1944 marked the end of the Luftwaffe's air superiority over Europe. Both aircraft here today are remarkable examples of years and thousands of hours of hard work by dedicated expert technicians. And both, without the support of their owners, would be lost. Bringing World War II's aircraft back to life is full of challenges and excitement. We thank all our Warbird members and teams of talented specialists that keep them flying, preserving aviation history for future generations. What do you think, folks? Pretty good video, huh? That was Scott Guyette and uh, Sleeping Dog Productions. And welcome back. Uh, I was here this morning. I was here yesterday, day before, and uh, I appreciate you all being here. The crowd seems to be growing, and, uh, and that's a very good thing. Um, this is a, a very unique opportunity that we have today. I'm not sure we've ever done uh, the Zoom the way we're doing it with Kurt. And Kurt, welcome. Uh, glad to glad to see you again. Thank you very much for being here. Um, he's he's going to be kind of our local. No, I shouldn't say our long range expert. Um, and I'll just I'll I'll say now, Kurt, if you, if you hear something that you think is maybe incorrect or uh, well, we use we, we in the Air Force we used to call it the BS flag. Okay, so so if you see or hear something, just you can wave your finger and we'll make the believe that's and 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 we'll come back to you. Um, but. Uh, we all know who he is at this point. The rest of the team here that we've got, and we've really got two teams. We've got two airplanes, two teams, and, uh, and we're going to be talking about each one. Each one is a little bit different. Um, the acquisition, um, the airplanes themselves, and, uh, and yeah, we're going to ask Kurt in a little bit to just get into some of the history. I had a Zoom call with Kurt, oh, I guess about a week ago or so, and he is an absolute wealth of information. And I'll say now, the way things are going to work, we're going to talk about... Kurt first with a little bit of the history of the airplane, its inception, its evolution. Um, then we're going to get into hey each airplane and the acquisition of each airplane. How it hey wh what happened to it? What how did it go down? Where did it go down? How did we get it here? The restoration of the airplane. Talk to some of the pilots of the airplane. Um, uh, do a little bit of a walk around uh, on the airplane, and then we're going to open it up to questions. And with the questions, um, Kurt's going to be part of that also. So we've got again a wealth of information here available to us and please be patient with us I am <clears throat> I'm not a professional at this uh, Connie talked me into it I don't know a couple years ago I guess and if you remember that uh, voice that you just heard on the video that was David Hartman and and something that David told me um, was hey when you do this kind of stuff Ed 
um, you probably only want to have like three guys up here. And well, do the math because right now we've got one, two, three, four, five, and Kurt. So we got six right now. So uh, so it's going to be uh, <clears throat> yeah a little bit of a challenge for me, but I'm going to do my best. And I'll start with just basic introduction introductions here. The first guy I got on my left, um, his name is Doc Winters, um, and uh, he uh, he is the owner of. Let's see, eeny, meeny, miny, that one right there, okay? That is his. He is the pilot of it also. Um, and I, I asked him briefly, I hate guys like this because they're overachievers. You know, he, he goes to school, he gets a medical degree, then he decides, oh, no, I want to go out and be a fighter pilot. So he goes through OCS with the Navy, turns into an F-18 pilot, and then comes back and, hey, is, becomes a, 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 an eye doctor, correct? Okay, an ophthalmologist. Uh, and, uh, and, oh, by the way, hey, now he's got a warbird. So, uh, so that's the guy here, and we're going to be uh, asking him for uh, some, some numbers and, and, and impressions of the airplane. But that's our first guy, and I'll just ask him to introduce the guy alongside him who's the second member of the team. This is Am I on? You're on. This is uh, Mike uh, Vatabankir. He uh, runs Midwest Aero Restorations, and they're responsible for this beautifully restored original aircraft. And uh, Dave uh, Young and Steve Schultz are out there, too. The three of them basically did it all. Okay, thank you. Um, Jim Martinelli is next, Director of Operations, Ericsson Aircraft. Um, and uh, he, again, is, is responsible for a great deal of that airplane over there. So, Jim, I'll let you introduce your team. Yeah. Uh, next to me is Doug Griffin. Doug is our uh, 109 pilot. Uh, he's acquired a lot of 109 time this summer. Uh, he's flown the 109 from Oregon all the way to Detroit and then back to here. And next to him is David Reed, our director of maintenance and David is uh, responsible for the mechanical restoration of the 109. Okay, thanks for the introductions. And Kurt, I'm going to turn it over to you for a minute here and just let you give somewhat of a history of the airplane, its, its inception, what it was supposed to do at first and how it evolves to pay these beautiful pe uh, airplanes that we see in front of us. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, it's an SSP. So uh, everything starts with, with an SSP. It's designer. Uh, he was only 36 uh, years old uh, when the ME109 took uh, for its first flight. Uh, a guy who was obsessed with lightweight and low drag engineering. A guy who was uh, obsessed with. Uh, Optimized airframe structures, just to give you a practical example, I'm pretty confident, for example, by the uh, might elaborate more on that. If you have a look at the attachment points uh, of the uh, main landing gear, uh, these also are the attachment points of the uh, engine mounting, of the lower engine mounting. So when the plane touches to the ground, the forces that are in Imposed on the landing gear are neutralized by the momentum that comes from the engine. Uh, he was always thinking in ways to optimize airframe structures, um, and of course, the requirement that came from the Luftwaffe was um, um, should be the plane, the fighter plane should be uh, easily road and rail transportable, uh, having in mind that uh, if you crash land the plane, it should be easy to be recovered and uh, uh, brought back to, uh, to uh, operations uh, as soon as possible. Uh, the, the production history uh, is also an important point. The uh, any one or I was relatively easy to produce. So on and on, uh, I think 33,000 have been produced. Uh, with only a handful to survive, and to my knowledge, only one example, which is totally original, which had been recovered by the Royal Air Force in the North African Desert in 1942, and then kept by the Imperial War Museum in London, uh, and had been flying uh, until I think 15 years ago. Uh, well, uh, that was Willy Messerschmidt, uh, who had in mind to build a lightweight fighter. And on the customer side, so to say, at the Luftwaffe, you also had two key people uh, which were decisive for the ME109's history. One of them was Ernst Udet, the second highest scoring ace um, in World War I after the famed Red Baron, 
with 62 kills, being now the uh, director of the technical office of the Air uh, Ministry. And the other one was Robert von Grein, also a World War I ace, uh, at uh, 28 kills, who was uh, heading the fighter department of the Air Ministry. These two guys had the intellectual capacity to draw the right conclusions from the incredible mass of dogfights they had in World War I. And the main conclusion was, dogfights are nothing for average pilots. Uh, regardless of the nations, uh, every nation had lost too many pilots in dogfights. So their idea of let's have pilot that is so superior that even an average pilot may score without being put into a dogfight, let Messerschmitt's passion for lightweight design. And that was the birth point of the 109. The outcome was a relatively light fighter uh, with uh, superior performance in dives and in climbs, uh, and of course in acceleration and in uh, speed, uh, having a high speed uh, wing air form. Uh, but which was uh, not as, perf uh, as, per as good performing at those speeds, but for that reason, Messerschmitt had designed mechanically operated slats, which you can see here on the airplanes, uh, which uh, were pushed into the beating edge of the wings when the airflow was tough enough, and which were popping out of the wings or slowly coming out of the wings when uh, the airplane, when the airflow decreased. When, when I'm uh, when I'm uh, going overboard, uh, in the first four years of the one of nine's operation of history, everything seemed to be confirmed uh, by the war in Spain and by the war in Poland and in France. But then the one of nine only met inferior opposition, like uh, Russian biplanes or relatively slow Polish or French fighters. Uh, which were um, which had something between 550 to 80 knots less top speed than 109, uh, and then it was easy, of course, uh, to uh, to uh, go for hit run uh, combats, uh, and uh, all of these uh, planes uh, were easy play for an average message with pilot. The whole thing turned for the Battle of Britain. There, the 109. Uh, like hurricanes and Spitfires. And now look at the Spitfire. The Spitfire uh, was a dogfighter by design. Look at that uh, beautiful with a little wing. Look at the, uh, the higher wing area, uh, which uh, made the Spitfire maneuverable over a much wider range of speed. Uh, that was the reason why, uh, in an uh, infuriated debate uh, with the chief of the German Luftwaffe, Hermann Göring, one of the, uh, the wing commanders of the German Luftwaffe, later to become General of Fighters, Adolf Gallan, uh, upon hearing this question, God, what do you need uh, to really cope with the Britons? Replied, give me a squadron of Spitfires. <laughs> was back on the top of the agenda again, and uh, 109 was not much of, um, uh, of a good dogfighter. It could be easily outturned by the Spitfires. Uh, for that reason, uh, Messer Schmidt tried to turn the 109 into a dogfighter, and that was the so called Friedrich first version of Fox uh, in today's uh, alphabet. Smooth and the cowling had been smooth, and uh, the elevator struts had been done away with, uh, the landing, the, 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 the tail wheel had been made flexible. Uh, so ha here you had the best you, can, you could get in airflow over 109. And for the for the died in the wool dog fighters of the Luftwaffe, of which Gunther Rohl was one, who whom Connie had mentioned before, the the F version really was what they longed for. Um, I once talked about the F and the several uh, 109 versions with Gunther Rohl, and he said, you know, Kurt, flying the F in combat that was like foil fencing. That was really. A capable weapon in the hand of a man who has seat of the pants, who has good spatial orientation, and who is a, a capable deflection shooter. 
that was the, the F. Then uh, the tides turned. Uh, Germany was in the defensive. Uh, the 109, which was originally designed for, for uh, being just a pure fighter, uh, became, uh, became assigned multi-roles, fighter bomber, all the like. The heavy, arm, the heavy weapons returned because they had to fight the B-17s. And then it was obvious by 1943, 1944, it had reached uh, the um, uh, the end of its development potential. It's still in the in the in the hands of a capable pilot. It still uh, was a respectable weapon, uh, but uh, in the hands of an average pilot, uh, it was not a match for the Mustangs and uh, for other uh, Allied fighters anymore. General, I hope I wasn't too too long. I lost my mic. Oh. Oh, and you, you guys knew all that, right? You knew, yeah, yeah, they're just nodding their head going, yeah, okay. Thank you, Kurt, what, and, and please stand by. We're, we're going to have some more questions for you for sure. Um, but that gives you a quick uh, idea of, of where the airplane came from. You know, and me being a former Air Force fighter pilot, that's the kind of airplane I'd, I'd want to fly back then. It's like, hey, you know, if I'm a mediocre fighter pilot, what do I want? I want a better airplane so I can beat the other guy out there. And not only that, but he mentioned the fact that, hey, you know, does he want a dogfight with a guy? No, you don't want a dogfight with a guy. You want to kill him, hey, on a, you know, either a high deflection gunshot and get out of there or, or the current day, you know, hey, uh, these uh, F-22s, you know, they're blowing the other guys up 30 miles away and the other guy doesn't even know they're there. So, uh, so yeah, what, what he says absolutely makes sense for that era. And, uh, and then, hey, uh, we get down to the actual airplanes right now. And I'm going to start with Doc and just say uh, the, first, the, the, the first question that I have is acquiring this airplane. It's got a very interesting story. I think you all will appreciate it. So, Doc, go ahead. Give me an idea of where this thing came from. So, like he said, there's 33,000, but there are very few able, actual, authentic restorations left in the world. Most of the ones you've read about are E-models. That uh, Black 6 he discussed 15 years ago was started in the 70s and 80s, and it flew for about 15 years in England, and then they stopped flying, and it was truly authentic, too. This was recovered from a lake in Estonia. Uh, it was the former Eastern Front for the, for the Germans as they were retreating in 1944. Lake Swilbo in 1990, uh, the pilot was returning to his base and was uh, hit and mortally wounded the uh, airplane. He was okay, he just set it down on a lake, slid out on that ice lake to the very western edge and jumped out and ran west. <laughs> and uh, it sank as the spring thaws came in 1944 and no one ever recovered or no one knew about it until after the wall came down and the Russians decided to make some money and sell some things. They pulled this out in 1990 and took it to Moscow and uh, showed it around for a little while and then it changed hands about five times and ended up not a lot done to it just the original all the original parts airframe everything just changed hands no one really restored it until we did we got it from a, a gentleman in Munich in 2012 and it took 10 years wow wow um, and then the restoration started, and how long was the restoration process? Ten years. <laughs> that, it's that, it's uh, when you're, I mean, they produced the, the most beautiful Mustangs in the entire world, and they did the Happy Jacks Go Buggy for me, and uh, to transition and try to translate as a mechanical engineer into a totally different language, totally different tooling, totally different aspect. It was a really rough and challenging ball game for them, and they uh, did it really well. Okay, and what model is this? Is this? It's a G6. It's a G6, okay. And I look, does it have leading edge slats on it? It has aerodynamic slats. They're okay. based, based on basically aerodynamic forces. They'll they'll deploy or not depending upon what the wing sees as far as air. Okay, and, and I'll ask Kurt, 
How does that compare with the E that you were just talking about? Is, is this a, the, the next generation, if you will? Is this a better airplane than that E model that you were just talking about? Yeah, well, the, uh, the uh, G6, of course, picked up weight because the, um, it, it, it had got heavier armament. Um, it was a capable airplane still, but it had to fulfill too many uh, purposes uh, for its original design. It had to serve as a fighter uh, against other fighters. Uh, it had to serve again uh, as a fighter against other bombers. That is, um, the, the, that explains the heavier armament. Um, and uh, it wasn't as easy to fly due to its uh, increased takeoff weight uh, as the E and the former versions and the F had been. Um, the slats, the slats were a special thing. Um, I recall uh, um, uh, a talk with Gunther Wald, Gunther Wald uh, who was so much a fan of the 109F, but he's never, he never got really familiar with the slats. Being a dogfighter, you know, in high bank turns, uh, the lower, the lower wing slat uh, used to pop out. Uh, when the airflow uh, uh, decreased, while the higher wing uh, slat still had been pressed into the leading edge, uh, which finally ended up in the airplane flipping over just when you were about to get the other guy. Uh, so for for a while, Gunther had the slats riveted into the leading edge of the wing uh, to make good for that. Uh, but as um, the war in the east advanced and they were uh, forced to move forward and forward to smaller airfields, to soft soft uh, ground airfields, uh, he could not just um, do away with the slats uh, because there he needed low landing speeds. I understand. I understand. Thank you. All right, Jim. How about uh, actually? Acquisition of your airplane. What, what, can you tell us that story. Yeah, so. My own. Uh, our airplane is actually was born as a uh, Spanish Bouchon and uh, was flown by the Spanish military until the movie The Battle of Britain. And at that time, the movie production acquired most of the Spanish Air Force's 109s and uh, Heinkel 111s to produce the movie Battle of Britain. Uh, one of the pilots who flew in the Battle of Britain movie was uh, Connie Edwards. At the end of the production, Connie ended up with uh, a large amount of, of those airframes, of the 109s. Brought them to Texas, stored them in Texas, and over the years, various collectors uh, were able to get them. In the early 1990s, Mr. Erickson, who owns the airplane, uh, struck a deal with Connie and purchased the airplane and brought it to Oregon and just assembled it and put it on static display. And in uh, 2015, the decision was made to make it airworthy and took us about uh, 20 months to do what you see here from what we got. Okay, talk about the engine a little bit. I think there's been some engine changes on this airplane, <laughs> haven't there? Yeah, so... Dave will be able to give you more in depth on that, but when we were doing the airplane, uh, the the Merlin powered Bouchon is kind of a it just doesn't you know it doesn't appeal to that that clean 109 look. So Mr. Erickson was thinking, you know, let's let's try to do something to to get closer to what you see here with uh, the Docks airplane. The decision was made to try an Allison. Uh, we mocked the Allison up in front of the the airplane. We borrowed some G10 cowling from uh, a friend of ours, and we realized we were able to put the Allison literally inside of unmodified G10 cowling, and the prop shaft ended up in the same exact location as where it was on the G10. So uh, engineering was done to develop an engine mount and uh, that stuff, and we put the Allison in it, and here it is. The rest is history, huh? Yeah. Huh. All right. How about Doc? Talk about your motor a little bit. What's in that thing? It's an original Daimler Benz 605 Alpha, and uh, it obviously is original because they didn't make any 
605s after the war, so all the Daimler engines you see flying are original engines. And there are several in Bouchons or closer airframes in Germany flying now. Um, but uh, they're very, very rare engines, and Mike Nixon spent uh, a great deal of time and effort and is quite expert at uh, restoring 605s and German engines. And this is probably his seventh or eighth, at least, uh, 605 Daimler-Benz engine. Wow. Okay. I got to ask Kurt, how about the, what's the reputation of that motor, of the, uh, uh, the 605? It, was, was it a good motor? Did it, and, and how many hours could you expect out of it before you had to rebuild it? Um, what was the, uh, the opinion of the pilots of the motor? So well, the pilots, of course, were, uh, were very fine with the engine because um, it was, to my knowledge, the first uh, airplane engine in mass production that comprised a mechanical fuel injection. That is, it was not really uh, subject to negative Gs. So if you had to evade from a fight, you just pushed the, uh, pushed the stick and, and then you were gone. While with the uh, carburetor-fueled uh, Merlin engines of the British, for example, uh, you had to avoid negative Gs, uh, else your engine would uh, go off for a couple of seconds. Uh, so the pilots always were very fine with the, uh, with the engine, but its uh, reliability, of course, uh, depended uh, on the theater of war uh, the airplane was in. Um, you must imagine that uh, if you fought uh, on the very far southeast of the front uh, in Europe, say uh, on the Black Sea, uh, the uh, supply lines were pretty long. Uh, and uh, due to the changing climate conditions, uh, a sensitive engine like this uh, high power 2,100 cubic inch 12 cylinder uh, was not easy to um, to maintain um, because just due to logistical affairs or it, it flew also in the deserts of Africa uh, and there uh, the um, time between overhaul uh, was in the double digits. How about uh uh, temperatures uh, you mentioned it was it better uh, in the in the cold was it better in the hot does it uh, does it overheat on the ground I know some of these airplanes do have problems in that regard does this have any any of those problems yeah that that, that might be um, it might be better to ask one of the guys uh, who really are the engine experts uh, okay. for that yeah you guys you guys who fly it uh, any any problems you know hey getting the thing started and, uh, and you know having to get it off the ground because it gets hot well the the high time pilot that I know of um, now um, in the world is a gentleman named Klaus Plaza in Germany and he's has three hundred and fifty some odd hours and he used to tell me it's about eight to twelve minutes depending on conditions between startup and it over temps and you can't take off okay regardless of really ambient temperature and or facing the wind or downwind or whatever it's you just don't have a lot of time and i it's my understanding that the spitfires are the same way those early airplanes the mark one mark two they were designed to squadron to basically leave the assembly point jump in your airplane and take off the grass whichever direction you were there was not a lot of oshkosh taxiing yeah <laughs> i understand Mustangs have that problem too here a little bit, I think. But uh, all right, good. Well, in that case, let's let's get into some of the pilot stuff, uh, as as Maverick or Goose would say, I guess. Huh? Um, let's uh, and that movie I think is going to be out here what on uh, Friday night. I think they got uh, uh, Top Gun Maverick being shown. Um, but anyway, in that regard, uh, flying time. Um, Who's got the most flying time in, in this thing? Yeah, they're pointing fingers. Okay, what do you think? Easy airplane to fly, tough airplane to fly. Um, you know, I, I just look at the, the, the landing gear and uh, the distance to the tail. Uh, it looks a little bit close coupled, but not bad. Is it, is it an easy tail dragger to fly or a hard tail dra dragger to fly? No, you're absolutely right. That's my first impression as well. You look at the airplane, it's uh, very intimidating. You know, evil-looking airplane, and it's like, uh, I don't know if I'm not so sure I want to fly it. Um, it's, it's intimidating, but I figured I'd, I'd give it a shot, and, uh, and I got in it, and I, I absolutely love the airplane. It's, it's not what 
you read about in the books in terms of landing mishaps and stuff. I just, I just the way I fly it is just that you know slow it up. You know, I'm probably about 120 knots on on base, slowing up to about 110 on short final, and probably 90 over the numbers. And I just hold it off until it's done flying in a three point attitude. And once it hits the ground, well, you can put your feet on the floor. It doesn't do anything anything weird. You prefer doing a three point to a uh, wheel landing? Oh yeah, I would not wheel land this airplane. I, okay. No, no, I would. Uh, I think it would be, you know, with the ge gear geometry the way it is yeah. and changing with the nose up and down, it would be it would be a handful. Yeah. And plus, you look at it, you know, the way the how far forward the gear is, in that the te the tail is really heavy mm -hmm. on the ground weight wise. It is really heavy, so to have the tail up in the air, if the main's on the ground, it's you're going pretty good clip. So. Okay, how about, how about just basic cruise? Uh, first air speeds, how fast, you know, if uh, you're, you're cruising to come to Oshkosh, what were you cruising at? Well, looking at flight aware, I was doing about 250 knots, 240 knots okay. across the ground. Okay. About and 210 indicated. Okay, and, and how much gas are you burning? How many gallons Both an hour? Both the Allison were burning 60 gallons an hour. Okay. Yeah. Um, and how about Doc and yours, same thing? Well, it's, it's a 605 at Kirk can correct me if I'm wrong, it, it's, it's, it's a much bigger engine than the Merlins and Allison's as far as displacement. I believe it's more in line with the, uh, the, the, the uh, class of the Griffin. So it inherently, since it's a bigger engine, it's going to use more fuel. And uh, I'm, we've, we're really young in the program, so we're not, don't have quite the numbers, but I'm sure it's in the 70s at least. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but it's very quick across the ground as far as uh, when you true it out nicely, and I run in the, all the German instruments in there, so I run in KPH and kilometers, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as the landing and characteristics and all that, you know, it was designed, like Kurt said, to basically disassemble it with three or five guys, put the wings on the side, put it on a rail car, and go to where the front was, because it's a very short-ranged fighter. It does not have a lot of gas, can't go anywhere. Really, so, and that was an Achilles heel for it, of course, right at the Battle of Britain. They really found that out. But, but go back again, um, I was always thinking before I started flying it, I mean, you're not going to build a fighter for 10 years, 35 to f really 45, they were putting them back together still with us bombing them. Um, you're not going to build 33,000 if they're just an animal. I mean, they've got to be a good airplane, both takeoff, landing, and up in flight. And it is, and then the little experience I've had, I've had great people talking to me like Klaus Plaus on how to fly it. Um, and I fly it in really nice conditions, and if you're staying on it, it's just fine. It a, tracks nicely, it sets down at three point just beautifully, it flies around the pattern like it lives there. So uh, I find it to be quite, quite enjoyable. Hmm. Okay. Um. We've talked about acquisition. We've talked about uh, a little bit about the restoration. Um, I'll talk to the restoration guys here just a second and, and ask, what was the most difficult part about restoring these things? And uh, I don't care anybody. All of it? All of it? <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, parts are probably not readily available. And if you do find them, they're probably very expensive or you got to manufacture them yourself. Um, and yeah. yeah, I would think it would be a tremendously difficult process. Yeah, everything you've said is, is right on. and. Uh, you know, another aspect that we've had to deal with was dealing with where these airplanes were built. And so we're dealing with people in Germany and Austria and, and some in the UK. Careful now. Careful now. We're, <laughs> we're dealing with people in, in Germany. Yeah. And they've been a fantastic help. I mean, we wouldn't have been able to do it without our friends in um, uh, Germany and Austria who have some uh, corporate knowledge of operating these types of airplanes. So. Uh, we could have done it without them, and, and like I said, it's we, we had our own set of challenges here, but when we run out of a part or we run into a, a, a roadblock, it's like, well, where, where do we go? Here in the States, I know where to go for P-51s and so forth, over to Europe. So that added the complexity there was more of time. How long is it going to take for them to make it, or have they made it, or how long is it going to get here, and are they really understanding what I am asking? So that's that's something we dealt with for 10 years. I understand. Um, how about gas? How much gas? Do, are both the same? How, how much does each one air, airplane hold? Ours yeah. holds about 105 gallons. Okay. Yeah, ours is close to about 108, 110. Same. So, so yeah. you're, you're right. It's really a short-range kind of airplane. You're not going to be up there very long. 
And uh, yeah, huh, interesting. All right. Um, other points of note, I guess, from a, a, a flying standpoint. Um, you guys uh, maneuvered, done acro, uh, you know, is it a high G airplane? Can you, what's, what's the G limit on these things? I know you're not going to take them up there, but when they were brand new, what, what was the G limit? Are we talking, you know, five, seven Gs, something like that? About five Gs on, on the airframe. Okay. And, and you, you don't do that anymore, probably, right? I mean, most of the time. We'll do aerobatics in it. No, yeah. It's, it's okay. a very nice flying airplane. Okay. And are you guys flying at all during the show here? Are you going to be, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. No? no. You guys, okay. So you're not going to see an ME-109 fly. All right. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kurt here for a minute because I know I'm he's got some stories about a, a guy who flew <coughs> these airplanes for a long time, was very successful. And, uh, and I'm curious, Kurt, your relationship with uh, that German ace named Gunther. Um, I know yeah. you were involved with a, a book about Gunther. I know you've got a wealth of information I involving the guy. Um, I wish I'd had the opportunity to meet him. But, uh, yeah, you got a quick story about Gunther Rall. And it, it, I'll, I'll, I'll let you describe exactly who he is if the crowd doesn't know. Yeah, well, Gunther Rall um, was uh, one of the uh, leading aces of World War II, uh, having scored 275 kills. So I think he's the third highest scoring ace in the history of air warfare. Um, if you have met him, you would have been surprised to have a relatively small, uh, introvert, uh, vivid, uh, but not, but not very extrovert or not very bragging or pretending guy, you know. Um, he, for me, he was the typical size of a fighter pilot. I, I, I cannot tell you in inches, but he was about one meter, 75 centimeters. Uh, that seemed to be something like the standard size of a German fighter pilot because guys of that size fitted exactly into the 109's cockpit. Uh, you, you should not be um, six feet tall. Uh, that's a bit too, too much for that airplane. Um, and uh, of course, he was like all fighter pilots uh, when we were talking about air combat. Uh, he needed at least three hands to show you uh, how things happen in the air. Uh, I got to know him, I think, very well. And, uh, you know, if you have to do with these World War II fighter pilots, uh, they all start with those old, colorful war stories. But if you get to know them better, uh, you also get to know uh, the uh, more thoughtful side of these people uh, and um, the, the way they think about war. Uh, and one thing that comes to my mind was when we were writing Gunther's biography, we were doing it in his beautiful home in Bad Reichenhall. Uh, and we had a working day uh, with everything laid out on his kitchen table uh, as all fighter pilots. Uh, he wasn't very much of a guy that uh, was happy to fill binders or something like that. He had everything, all the documents stored in a, in a chest and then we, we put it on the table and I tried to sort it out uh, while a recording device was on the table and we were talking about it. And then it was up to me to put that into proper German language. Uh, so uh, we had a heavy working day and after that was done, we were sitting on the porch. He poured every one of us uh, a glass of whiskey and for a while we were saying nothing. And then I turned over to him and I saw tears running from his face. And I said, uh, in these days, uh, we were already on a first name basis. I said, Gunther, what's the matter? And he says, you know what the real thing is about war? Of the 275 guys I've killed, I saw the faces of at least 200. Uh, and they haunt me at night because they were my age. They were looking like me. And we were when we were turning in on the Eastern Front, uh, the combat altitudes were so low, you did not have to wear an oxygen mask. So you could really see the other guy. And you knew in two or three minutes it would be over, finally, for one of, of you, either him or you. Uh, and with age, this haunts me more and more. It keeps me awake at night. And this was the other side of the guy. He could talk brilliantly about air combat, uh, even after World War II. 
uh, he flew the F-104. He introduced, in fact, the F-104 to the German Air Force, and he had amassed a considerable number of hours in the F-104. So he really represents quite a part of aviation, military aviation history, and he always was a fighter pilot. But he was also a very, very thoughtful guy. Thank you. Uh, interesting perspective and, and something I don't think any of us knew of that man. Um, I, I would ask, though, uh, you, you mentioned the number of kills. I think people would be interested to know, yeah, he, he shot down a lot of airplanes, but he was also shot down. Is that not correct? Yeah, I think he had to bail out uh, eight times, uh, and he had one severe crash landing in Russia, uh, an occasion at which he broke his back three times. Uh, so that brought him into hospital for nine months, uh, and the good the, the good thing about that hospital stay was there he met his wife who was a medical doctor in that hospital. Um, so they they married, um, and then of course he would have had the opportunity to withdraw. He would have had the opportunity to, f to fly a desk somewhere in the air ministry. But he returned to his squadron on the Eastern Front because he at the age of 24. For the other guys was the old man. He was the one who was the squadron commander, and he knew very well. He, these guys uh, relied on him as the old man. They uh, they were lost if he would not come back. So he returned uh, to being a frontline pilot um, and uh, had to fly with um, with cushions for a while uh, because um, when he touched down uh, that. Um, that, that was very painful for him. Uh, and also in combat, uh, high G, positive high G maneuvers were painful, but finally he adapted uh, and he made his career until he had scored 275 kills. Uh, and at the age of 27, this also amazes me over and over again, at the age of 27, he was in command of a fighter wing uh, that comprised something like uh, 120 fighters and 2,000 men. So these guys really had received a crash course in leadership uh, in wartime, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, at, and that at incredible loss rates. You know, uh, he was one of the very few to survive who had flown in World War II from the first to the last day. Okay. If, if you met, if you met somebody like him, uh, you know, the, Gunther had something like six hundred hours in missions, mm -hmm. uh, and on a one hundred and nine. He still was a predator uh, in such in such an airplane, uh, though the 109 was by the, by that time by the end of the war was technically inferior to a Mustang. As I remember, he also lost his thumb. Is that not correct? Didn't he well, have he yeah. had he had his thumb shut off too? So uh, quite a, quite an amazing man. All right, thank you, Kurt. Um, I'm gonna. We've got about ten minutes left right now for the official program. I'm going to ask somebody in the group here to do a quick walk around, and uh, we'll only do one airplane, so uh, it doesn't really matter. But we got a uh, okay, any, mini miny, mo. Okay, looks like it's it's your turn. Yeah, I'll go ahead and do ours. Uh, I'll get up. Uh, so ours is the Allison-powered G10 variant of a 109, which is converted from a Spanish Bichon here, what you see behind us. And a number of challenges that we had with restoring this particular aircraft was just fitting the engine, like Jim had said, mentioned earlier. And with the Curtis Electric propeller, it has all original G10 cowling that we sourced from Eastern Europe, and then also the parts. Um, something that we thought about for a long time is we always wanted it to look authentic when the cowling is closed. So the one, the exhaust was one of the most difficult parts of the restoration, being how it's lower and the header manifold system that you see here. I mean, getting it to really come out in the same spot, using the induction scoop as the Allison's a downdraft carburetor. And another problem with the Al running the Allison, like they were talking about earlier, is the overheating. And so we actually put oil coolers outboard of the landing gear wells as well, and had new radiators made by Pacific down in Southern California. But we found that we did end up not needing the oil clears in the outer part of the wing because the radiators work so well in this airplane that we the overheating issue is practically non-existent. Um, another neat feature of the later model G10s is the Erlo Hob canopy, which um, 
gets rid of the bars and the supports in the earlier canopies. It's a little bit lighter. And then as you, and for vis better visibility, and then as you move farther aft, the tall tail where you'll see the counterweight of the rudder goes through the vertical versus the short one where their counterweight is part of the rudder itself and it eclipses the vertical and they did that because of crosswind conditions and a little bit better maneuverability. But uh, those were the, some of the biggest challenges other than installing the Allison engine for reliability and that's the primary reason that we did it so that uh, we could fly it across the country from Oregon and display it for you today. Thank you. All right, I think we've got seven plus a little bit in terms of time to go. So I'm going to open it up, and I know there's going to be some questions out there. So <laughs> we've got microphones for you guys. So hold on and uh, go ahead and speak up. Just one. I don't think, is this working? It, it's it on. Like yep, it is. You're talking. Uh, question the restorers for both aircraft. Do you, are there like shop? manuals that exist today for these and obviously the originals would be in german so to even know how to p restore this what documentation did you go off of did you do have the shop manuals were they translated we do we um we have all the original german manuals that we know of uh there are several uh manuals that were translated somewhere i think in the uk that we also acquired um, we have a limited set of blueprints that have also helped and those are those are invaluable um, but yeah it, we have a lot of documentation and then uh, kind of uh, second to that um, I mean uh, in the pictures of the of the one that's running the Daimler Benz engine the, it looks like when they fished it out of the river or lake or whatever it was you know was it complete this thing complete or I guess question for both of you how much how much like in-house fabbing did you have to do on components to get these airworthy? So for us, it was a little bit different in respect that it was in the Battle of Britain movie, like we had mentioned earlier, and it wasn't a flying airplane per se. It did have a lot of corrosion issues um, just for sitting for so long, but we did a lot of sheet metal work to the bottom of the wings, the tail section, and uh, in between the landing gear underneath of the cockpit area. Uh, but as far as sheet metal, it's a pretty original Spanish Bouchon airframe. And then we retro, from the firewall forward, everything underneath of the cowling is built from scratch. I don't have a microphone, but I'm a loud guy. So did you have, what about like sub systems? Sub components or systems, not just the sheet metal. Did you have to like take the drawings and have suppliers make these in present day we did have the blueprints just as they did and we had said most not most things but a lot of things remanufactured uh right to the print as far as all the way down to the metallurgy the type of metal the grain structure and all of that so it would be functional i just want to i just want to thank you guys for one you know the money that it cost to do this and the time um, I've been coming to Oshkosh since 1978, and I have never seen an ME-109 ever physically here, and there's two of them here. And I think one year there was supposed to be an ME-109 and a Fuck Wolf 190 out of California, but for some reason they didn't make it. So, again, thanks for bringing this. This is a real treat. I'm, I mean, I'm kind of a World War II historian guy. So. <laughs> thanks Thank a lot. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Kyle's got one up there. Uh, there we go. Question, question for Doc. Uh, the original uh, fuselage, uh, you are not able to use that in the restoration. Do you have any plans for that original fuselage? Well, actually, we did use parts from the original fuselage, and a really good gentleman in Munich who is great at rebuilding, restoring fuselages from the war is obviously in his German shop. He took it upon himself to use as much of our original fuselage in, in the uh, restored fuselage that we, that we have now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kyle's got, oh, we got one right here. Uh, paint schemes, and at, on the G6, is that a recreation of the original scheme? And on the G10, is that Herman Graf? That's correct, yes, Herman Graf for the G10. Okay. Yeah, so this, the, uh, the G6 here is, uh, we had a lot of re residual paint left on the airplane when it came out of the water. 
We also uh, work very hard with some modelers. Modeler guys are just off the charts with uh, all this kind of detail. And so we actually hired a guy to, and he built a fantastic model after looking at all of our skins that we had laying out on the floor and uh, came up with this pattern. The wing pattern slightly non-standard, um, but uh, that's the way it was. So, uh, yeah, and, and then also used the 4100 series serial number uh, BF109 G6s that had photographed, been photographed during the war, kind of threw those together, Earl of built airplanes, and this, according to the historians, is, is its most likely uh, paint scheme. We certainly had the yellow on the chin cowling, and we had the yellow at the tail as well. Okay. Uh, up there. Some, there we go. Okay. Yeah, again, thanks for doing this. But I'm kind of curious on the early development. Were there prototype models? Or is, did it come from something else? And what did they look like or compare to what we see? All right, Kurt, you're on. Did you hear that question? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, there, were, there was a series of prototypes uh, also housing smaller engines. Uh, the Daimler-Benz engine wasn't available right from the start of the ME109's history. It first was powered by Rolls-Royce Kestrel, uh, but uh, the uh, Daimler-Benz engine was already under development, so it was meant to finally uh, fit into the uh, power uh, the 109. Of course, um, there were there was a number of pre-series models, prototypes, and the like. Okay, a follow-on to that is how about um, other uh, aerodynamic changes? Wingspan? Did they change wingspan at all during its uh, its, its its evolution? Yeah, uh, the uh, from from the F series, from the Friedrich, uh, the 109 had got rounded wingtips. They did not ever, to my to my knowledge, they did never change the airfoil. Okay. The wing profile always remained the same, uh, but the um, the wing uh, got uh, rounded wingtips uh, to make good for the induced drag um, at the end of the rectangular wings of the E series. Mm -hmm. So it went faster. It turned faster. Uh, it was more reliable, uh, and that was one of the major changes of the wing. Okay. Uh, another change, uh, also Michael uh, might elaborate on that, was uh, due to the modification of the landing gear. Uh, they, they tried to improve the angle of the wheels with regard to the struts. Uh, so when you, when you retracted the landing gear, uh, the wings needed a bulge to house the wheels. You are standing right in front of it, General. Uh, so, yeah, so there you can see the bulge in, uh, in the wing that houses the landing gear that also came with the G-series, I think. Um, and that is why, and also for other reasons, giving the ammunition feeders for the heavier guns that were mounted on top of the wing, that is why the, from the G-series on, the ME109 was nicknamed the bump or the bulge by its pilots. Uh, uh, okay. Thank you. All right. We got another question way in the back. Does he have a mic back there? Oh, we got... Okay, let's go over on this side then first. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, the G6 is equipped with a drop tank. Many years ago, I had the opportunity to ask Adolf Galland about the combat endurance of 109s during the Battle of Britain. I said to him, did you have drop tanks? His response was that the aircraft were fitted with drop tanks. The drop tanks had been tested and they worked wonderfully. However, in 1940, at the time of the Battle of Britain, at the time of the Battle of Britain, they didn't have drop tanks. The supply system didn't make them available. Can you comment on that, please? So I guess that's that a question for me, I guess. Yes. Yeah, I, I'd say go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's all true. It's all true. The combat endurance of the 109 was uh, slightly above one hours. I mean, it had a as as the as the guys mentioned, it had something like uh, a hundred and five gallons tank, um, and it consumed uh, in combat. In combat, it consumed uh, about a hundred uh, hundred gallons per hour. So um, when wow. you were escorting bombers from France to London, you really had to keep an eye on your fuel guard. Uh, to make sure you, you make it home. And more than one pilot had to ditch in the channel. There were heavy losses uh, for uh, of pilots who did not make it home over the English Channel. Hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, go ahead. Right there. I have it. Yep. 
I, so this is probably more of a tactical uh, question regarding the 109, but I read that starting in 1944, um, when the Allied bombers were increasing in numbers and obviously you had the, 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 uh, the P-51s coming into service, that along with the, the 109's counterpart, the Focke Wolf 190, if and when possible, they would try to get both up in the air and the 109s would be used to divert or distract the escorting fighters while the more rugged 190s would attack the bombers. And my question is, were those tactics um, ever effective or was it a case of futility where there were so many fighters that regardless of how many 109s or 190s um, were employed in that manner, were they ever effective um, against Allied bombers? I think that is also a historical question, and uh, Kurt may have some insight into that. I don't know the answer. That was established air tactics by the German Luftwaffe to make good for the deficiencies of both uh, airplanes. The Focke Wolf had an optimum, how do you call that, uh, pressure height for the engine of about 5,000 meters, uh, that is 15,000 15, feet, uh, whereas the Messerschmitt 109 uh, was very good in high altitude uh, combat. So, uh, and also the uh, Focke Wolf 190 had an uh, 190 had an air-cooled uh, radial engine, which was, was much more resistant to receiving hits. So um, it was an established tactics for the German Luftwaffe that the 190 units attacked the bombers, whereas the 109s um, uh, were responsible for, for, for top cover and responsible for distracting the uh, Allied fighters from the bomber units. Okay, so right you were. Absolutely. Okay, over here again. Oh, Mr. Rausch. I'm out of my normal position hey, here. Jack. I'm oh, a friend. Oh, I, yeah. I, I'm a friend. No, no, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jack Rausch. Um, and uh, I, I will say no more. Obviously, the crowd knows you, Jack. I, I, wanted to, I prefer to be anonymous here, but I'm a friend of Kurt's. And I uh, saw, I went to see uh, Gunther in Germany, and I had many occasions in the United States to interact with him. But a couple of things I think that people should know about Kurt, uh, about Gunther, even this limited time we've got, is that uh, he, uh, he he didn't receive the highest uh, honor from the German uh, from Hitler for for his uh, success in the air. He didn't get the swords and diamonds; he just got the swords. And uh, it was also the case that uh, when they were doing the editing of Kurt's book, and uh, he was picking all the pictures uh, of the that went in the book, I was present, and uh, he uh, gave me an, a look at the pictures, and uh, he would look at he had uh, like little Kodak pictures, and uh, he would comment on what was happening with the person on the picture, and then he would lose a tear, and he would go to the next picture and lose a tear. All, all the people were dead that he was talking about. And one of the things that come out of uh, one of the many symposiums I uh, prepared with him is that he had the same emotion toward doing the things that were good for his homeland and his, his, his family that the American pilots did. And for that reason, he became good friends with the many of us. Thank you, Jack. And, and later, if, if you weren't here yesterday, Bud Anderson was uh, our, our guest. And uh, later this afternoon, I do believe, Bud is going to be doing a walk around with uh, these gentlemen here, I think with Doc around an ME-109. It could be very interesting to watch a P-51 Ace walk around an ME-109. So I can hardly wait for that. All right, other uh, questions? Oh, here we go, Karen. My question has to do with pilot training. Uh, how many hours flying time did new pilots have to have before they went to the 109 in the early stages of the war? And then how many hours did they have later at, towards the end of the war? Uh, what's the difference in experience? Yes. Um, I, can, I can answer uh, very briefly on that. Uh, Post-war, uh, the pre-war pilots, of course, received an excessive training uh, that was largely comparable to the training Bud Anderson had received. Uh, I think Bud was shipped to Europe with uh, 
something like 400 hours in total under his belt. Uh, most of them, of course, in fighters. And that was also pre-war fighter training in Germany. From 1943 on, uh, training was um, cut uh, all the while due to fuel shortages and other reasons. And in the last 12 to 15 months of the war, an average fighter pilot who um, came to the front line had something like 100 hours in total, 15, 1, 5 hours on type. Uh, and uh, the, the loss rate uh, was just like that. Um, of, at the end of the war, that is in the last 12 month, months of the war, only uh, one of 10 pilots survived his first five missions. Wow. 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 Okay, another question up front here. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, my question is more for the um, Midwest guys. Um, I know you said earlier that um, you won't be flying the airplane during the air show, but is there a chance that we can hear it on the ground with an engine run at some point this week? Uh, to be determined, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so just to add to that, um, I'm obviously from the UK, and I've heard Daniel Ben 605s um, before, and they sound absolutely phenomenal. And the guys, if they do get a chance to run it, it sounds phenomenal. It doesn't sound anything like a Merlin or an Allison. And it feels different in the airplane, too. <laughs> <laughs> it just has a just a really nice, wonderful, deep rumble to it. If I, if I can add one thing from before about the fuel, someone had a great fuel question. And that's one. That was one of the Achilles' heels of all the early fighters in, in World War II was fuel and range. And then, and as you go through a war, you anticipate what you need. And of course, day one, you don't have what you need. Um, Jack and Jay were nice enough to visit me about ten or fifteen years ago in San Antonio, and he took off in his Mustang with Jay in the back, and they flew direct to Chino, mm -hmm. nonstop, mm -hmm. in the Mustang. Mm -hmm. You can put you know close to five hundred gallons in it. And these have a hundred. Yeah. So, I'm I'm sure there's situations where, I mean, there's it's always nice unless you're on fire to have too much gas. But, but when they when they flew over Europe, the when they when we we had the idea on drop tanks too, and we thought about them too, and we were running out of range too in 42 and 43. Our bombers got there in 42, and our loss rates in 43 were pretty substantial because our fighters would go a certain distance and then they had to come back because they were on their, of course, only internal, no aerial refueling, of course. So obviously the Germans would be smart and wait to that range until they turned and then descended upon them. Mm -hmm. And of course, once we got ideas on drop tanks, even with drop tanks, the P-47 and P-38, I'm not sure, were nearly as efficient as the Mustang. And it's been said, you know, the Mustang helped shorten the war of several months because they could fly all the way to Berlin, fight, and then fly all the way back, all on gas of their own. Yep, yep. And and by the way, we've got Lucky Luckadoo, who's going to be here Saturday morning, uh, the author of the book, Damn Lucky, uh, B-17 pilot from World War II, who did those missions, was escorted by the P-51s, and he made his 25 missions and made it home. He'll be here Saturday morning, and it uh, should be a very, very interesting uh, interview with him. All right, Kyle, up top there, we got another question. Uh, so I've read uh, that the 605 uh, was derated uh, in terms of power output fairly early in its life, but I could never find out why. Do you guys have any insight to that? Do you guys have any idea? Derated? No, it'd be nice if Mike Nixon knew about that. The 605s came in an Alpha and a Bravo, and they uh, had different reduction gear cases in the front, and... Uh, I that's all to stop talking. Maybe did, Kurt, did you know anything about a derating of the motor of the 605? Did they derate it that you know of? Yes, I know, but don't ask me for the reasons why. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Another question down front here. Oh. Hold on, we're, we need a mic. Uh, we're working on it. It's down now? Yep, you okay. got it now. Um, when it comes to the restorations, was there one specific part that stands out in your memory from each build that was like either for a technical reason or for another reason just stands out to you, to, to, that was difficult? 
for us, <clears throat> from the very beginning, uh, converting all of our procedures from American to German was our difficult uh, step. I mean, we had to retool for a different uh, angle of rivet. Uh, we had to retool for different diameters because it's all metric. We had to re we had to co-op with uh, the Collings Foundation on a complete set of um, appropriate DIN rivets. Um, so we, our goal from the beginning was to make it as completely German as possible. We didn't incorporate any AN American hardware. Um, so we, we, that alone just really had us thinking, what are we doing? <laughs> but you know, it, going forward, it's going it may be more difficult to maintain the airplane if something breaks. It's a fitting that we just can't go get. We may have to make it. That's just something that, uh, Doc's accepted, and, and we're, we're going to make it happen. <laughs> Thank you, Doc. Yeah. Thank you, Doc. Um, even though we have the, the drawings and everything like that with the aircraft, uh, having to translate everything since it's a Bouchon from Spanish into English, and then, like they were saying, the metric spec versus the standard. Um, and then plating was another big one that we found. Um, sending the hardware out to get stripped and replated, and a lot of times... If the plating wasn't done to the DIN spec, and they would do it to the United States mill spec, then it wouldn't fit back into the hole that it came out of. So then we would have to work through that issue as well, and that that was really challenging. Yeah, we found that early on. Uh, we sent some. We thought, oh well, most of the hardware appeared to be black. Uh, we'd set it out, got a CAD plated, brought it back. We couldn't get nothing to fit. The precision was so tight that I they didn't really do any plating they just sort of uh much like you buy um it's like a it's oxidized, oxidized. Yeah. yeah so we bought an oxidizing kit and stripped our hardware and oxidized everything ah those darn germans you know <laughs> <laughs> that was said many times <laughs> all right other questions are oh we got one over here go ahead for the guys flying the damler and since you're flying it what kind of TBO do you have on the engine? Again, it would be great to have Mike Nixon here. I, I do believe that they are significantly reduced compared to the Merlins. And even the Merlins, I was told, I don't know if this is true, but like they'd throw them away at 200 hours even if they were running good. And uh, so they, were, they are very time intensive and need to paid attention to every single flight. The man hours per hour of flying is probably going to be pretty, pretty gosh darn significant. Okay, got one at the top there. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, question about the cannon, how it's designed and how it fires through the spinner, if you could explain that. And the second question would be about the main landing gear, the, the camber, the angle of the tires. It seems very excessive. Okay. Uh, as you know, the, the gear is like that, so like we said, it could be transported really quickly, taken apart and gone to the front, and that's why they left the gear like that on the fuselage, so you could just unbolt the wings, put them on the side, and you don't have to touch the engine or the tailplane or anything. Just put it all together, put it on the rail car, and go. Take it off the rail car, put the wings on, and you go flying. And that's why they left them like that. So if they left the gear on the fuselage like that, they had to adapt, obviously, the geometry. And maybe Kurt can help me, too. I, I do believe they changed the, the geometry a little bit throughout the war on different on different um, types, and they actually had fatter tires on some of the some of the squadrons that that uh, flew in, you know, Tundra, where they needed a, a fatter tire that made even bigger bulge on the wing, and and they had to incorporate the angle so it would fit in the wing and not be exposed too much. But you can still see a little of exposure. So, to answer your question, it was predominantly for their, I believe, their ease of transport. Does he have any comments on the camber? Any any comments, uh, Kurt, on, on the camber of the gear? Yeah, um, not 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 in detail, but it's perfectly right. Uh, the uh, main landing gear had been uh, reworked several times, also to make good for the constructive deficiencies of the whole thing. Uh, the longer war lasted, the more unexperienced the pilots were that were put on training in the 109. Uh, the more difficult it became uh, for an unexperienced, uh, because the pilots were so unexperienced, to take off and land in that thing without uh, really do, doing harm to it. Um, I, I, I recall one story. 
uh, of a very experienced man uh, who had 59 kills in the 109 only against Western allies and whose name was Julius Meinberg. And one day, uh, I was invited, Julius was invited along with me uh, to an air show in England at the Shuttleworth Collection because they wanted to have an ace of the Battle of Britain. Uh, and all the, pi all the planes in the Shuttleworth Collection were piloted by active Royal Air Force pilots who next Monday morning were to strap in their Phantoms uh, and other uh, and, and Jaguars and things. So after the show, um, they asked Julius Meinberg, uh, sir, how many kills do you have? And he said, yeah, well, I did not really count exactly, but it, I guess it was 59. And did you ever have uh, an, uh, a dogfight with a Spitfire? Oh, yes, several. And how many Spitfires did you shoot down? And he said, well, something around 40. And for a minute, everything fell silent. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then he said, and then he said, but you know what? I crashed so many 109s on air talk and on, on, on takeoffs and landings that normally your king should have awarded me a Victoria Cross. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that perspective. <laughs> All right, we got one over here, Kyle. Gentlemen, uh, the airframes that Connie Edwards had, those went to various buyers. Did you share any technology, parts, information, or with your restorations and those airframes, and can we expect more 109s to be restored from those uh, those owners? Yeah, uh, we didn't really share a lot. Those uh, when they were bought out in a kind of a lump sum, they went to Europe and were dispersed around. Most of them have been restored to flying condition uh, as Bouchons. I wouldn't say we really shared much with them. Much like uh, the Midwest guys were saying, we dealt with a lot of uh, modelers and a lot of other people in Europe who, who are kind of in the 109 world. Okay, thank you. Oh, we got one right here. Yep. Ooh, you you okay? I'm okay. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, is this? Oh, perfect. Okay, so I have a historical question about the 109 that I hope isn't too out of the box, but when it was first selected by the Luftwaffe, uh, did it have to compete with other models of fighters? And if so, what were they? And how did the 109 win? Good question. Okay. I, uh, go ahead, Kurt. You're, you're the guy on that one. Yeah, of course, there was a competition against um, um, uh, airplanes from Heinkel, uh, from Arado, from all the major German manufacturers, and it was a tough competition. Uh, but and, and still, and still, debate is going on. Why did the ME-109 win this competition? Because other airplanes, for example, had that wider track landing gear. Uh, other airplanes seemed to have been um, uh, aerodynamically smoother than the 109. For example, the Heinkel uh, 112 had an elliptical wing like the Spitfire and was more of a dogfighter. Uh, so debate is still going on. Why did the 109 uh, win? And all the records of these days have been lost in World War II. Uh, but uh, it's my guess that it won finally uh, because it was so easy to manufacture, uh, and as Doc pointed out, uh, it was easy to transport. Uh, it was rail and road transportable, and that really mattered in a war of movement that Hitler already had in his mind. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we've got last question. We've got the last question, and yes, we have a youngster. Go ahead. What's the fuel consist? <laughs> fuel capacity compared to a Spitfire. <laughs> fuel. fuel capacity compared to a Spitfire. What's the fuel capacity compared to a Spitfire? Uh, I believe the Mark 9 Spitfire, Mark 5 and 9, which are right around the time frame of these, it, it's pretty comparable. I think they hold like 115 or 120 gallons and... Uh, Doc says 108, ours holds 105, so 
I think they're within 10 or 15 gallons of each other without drop tanks. Okay, thank you very much. And with that... I'm going to wrap it up and say thank you, gentlemen, for what you've done. Uh, thanks for the restoration, the acquisition. Thanks for the flying. Uh, thanks for the expertise. And I'll say the same thing to you, Kurt. Thank you so much for uh, your knowledge, your expertise, um, and, and your stories. Uh, it was an honor to be with you. I wish I would be there uh, in, in real life. Thank you very much, and Connie and I plan to come visit. <laughs> so with that, folks, again, thank you very much, and we'll be uh, back here tomorrow morning, and we've got a Medal of Honor winner who is going to be here tomorrow. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.